Welcome everyone. Today we have a guest from the University of Central Florida. His name is Ricky Barrett and he researches f immune cells and how they regulate fat metabolism. Welcome to the podcast, Ricky. Thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. So how would you describe your research to an ordinary person and kind of try and get them to understand like why it's important and why they should think about it? Yeah, so I actually have to do that quite a bit. <laughs> so hopefully I've got a refined version here of it. Um, so basically, I work in an atherosclerosis lab, and, and a big part of a lot of these cardiovascular diseases are the immune system, actually. Um, and so part of my work is looking at some of the kind of quirky things that the immune system does. Uh, everyone kind of thinks about the immune system as just, you know, the body's army uh, fighting off invaders and uh, killing viruses and bacteria and all that. But the immune system actually has a lot of other functions in the body. And it's only pretty recently that we've become aware of, of how much the immune system does in the body. Uh, and to kind of keep that army analogy, you know, a big part of its job is fighting off, you know, invaders and protecting the body. But, you know, as with any army, they also do a lot of other work as far as, you know, rebuilding areas that have been destroyed and kind of providing aid and nourishment. Um, and also reallocating resources. And that's kind of the part that I focus on right now is the immune system's ability to kind of push your metabolism in different directions. Um, and it's pretty good at that. It is a very energetically taxing thing to mount an immune response. And so most of the immune cells in your body have a pretty full arsenal of ways that they can uh, move fat metabolism or sugar metabolism uh, and shift it in ways that help the body fight off infection or do other things that it needs to do. Very cool. So if the immune system is like the army, it's also the army corps of engineers and it has to mount these supply chains and that's how you would further that analogy, I guess. Correct. Yeah. It, um, it's going to reallocate resources once it's mounting a response of any kind. Um, and it can also do other things that people don't normally consider. It can nourish cells back to life. You know, if you have an injury site, it's going to go in and not only fight off the infection, but it's going to kind of triage and look at different cells. If they're too far gone, you know, it's going to consume them and, and get them out of there. But the cells that are somewhat damaged and salvageable, it can actually nurse those cells back to life um, to help kind of rebuild that wound area or kind of remodel the tissue there to make sure that everything's going to go back to normal. Um, people don't really think about the softer side of the immune system, but it's something that it's capable of doing. And in, in order to do all those functions, it needs the energy to do it and the energy in the ways that it needs it. And so it's pretty capable of uh, talking to some of the major metabolic centers in the body, like fat and muscle, and uh, re-instructing them on how to do their jobs. <laughs> Very neat. So supplying your immune system with the proper resources seems pretty paramount, I guess, through diet or how is that mainly modulated? Um, so the main thing is the immune system is going to respond to obviously what you're eating. Um, and that's one of the things that we're looking at is since we're an atherosclerosis lab, metabolism is a huge part of uh, what we research and a lot of the problems that we think about. In particular, this research is very applicable to type 2 diabetes. And it's been thought that recently, you know, with poor diet or other things in the environment, um, in particular, we think about a lot of fried foods or high sugar diets and refined sugars that spike your blood sugar really quickly. A lot of these uh, are going to put a little bit of stress on your body. And in the process, it's going to kind of tick off the immune system, right? In fried foods, you have what we call a lot of oxidized lipids. Uh, and lipids is just a term for fat or oils. That's a category that those fats and oils fall into. Mm -hmm. um, and when they're heated up, they get oxygen molecules attached to them. And that happens a lot in like deep fryers. Like if you're going to McDonald's and get in your French fries, you know, that oil is kept in extremely high temperature for up to a week. Um, and so it alters those fat molecules. And when they go into the body, uh, you can't metabolize them the same way. And it's up to the immune system to take care of those altered fat molecules. And so they'll do their job, but if you're consuming a lot of those, it kind of ramps up the immune system. And same thing for sugars as well. If you're eating refined sugars, it's more the delivery of the sugars and the sugars themselves. When you're, the refined sugars tend to go into your bloodstream very quickly and spike your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. um, and this kind of ticks off the immune system as well because it needs to pick up the slack to help uh, you know, control these metabolic stresses that you're going through. And when it does that, it tends to release different signals that are similar to if it was fighting an infection. And in the process of doing that, 
uh, it's going to kind of mess up the metabolism of the fat cells, right? And so the setting that I kind of focus on is these immune cells that live within the fat. And so through diet or any other sort of challenges, if you're kind of upsetting these immune cells and causing them to mount this immune response, what they're going to do is to try to supply as much energy as they can to all of the cells that need to fight this response. Uh, and the job of fat cells is to store energy. So what they kind of end up doing is keeping the fat cells from processing the fat or sugars efficiently. Um, and what that does is keeps the levels kind of unusually high in the bloodstream and keeps fat and sugars from going to the correct tissues. They kind of end up in the wrong places and it, and it throws the whole thing off. Hmm. And so you can get like insulin resistance, which, you know, in, in diabetes is kind of a, a big problem. And uh, you maybe have this chronic activation of the immune system in response. Do these cells kind of get tired out or desensitized uh, in, in terms of that? Exactly. You can get both of those. Um, insulin resistance is one of the big ones. Uh, so they can release different hormones. Uh, one in particular I'm actually looking at right now is prolactin. And that's not one that people would ever consider. It's actually the hormone that's responsible for lactation in women. And it was thought to only be made in the brain, but we found that prolactin and other hormones that control metabolism, these immune cells can actually produce them themselves. They kind of short circuit the system, if you will. And then in their local environment, they kind of steal the brain's hormones and pump them out themselves in order to control the metabolism. And so in the case of prolactin and some of the other hormones, they actually lower the insulin sensitivity. And they've shown in mouse models, they are actually able to remove these macrophages through some clever genetic engineering um, and the insulin sensitivity returns. And so what they're able to show in that is that a lot of this uh, and these particular cases of type 2 diabetes from bad diet and all of that, that it's actually the immune cells that are resident in this fat tissue um, that are causing a lot of this insulin re uh, insulin resistance. So, Very neat. Yeah, so it's it's the immune cells' fault in, in that respect, right? But we wouldn't want to get rid of macrophages entirely. So is there any are there any ideas in the field of ways in which we might have a practical therapy, a translational therapy? Because I imagine if we got rid of macrophages, and correct me if I'm wrong, you would have a lot of problems within the body. Yeah, you you definitely have some issues. They're, they're very useful, and they're supposed to be there. Um, and kind of to take their point of view, this is a perfectly normal and healthy response for them to do. If you, if you are infected by a virus or a bacteria, like I said, it takes a massive amount of energy for all of these immune cells to proliferate and be able to fight off that infection. And so in the case of an acute infection, this is an important response because you don't want fat and sugars being stored away for a later time when this is the actual time that they need it. And so this is a normal thing for them to do to kind of reallocate all of these nutrients to the bloodstream where these immune cells can um, take them up and, and use that energy to fight the infection. Uh, but in the case of you know poor diet, or other kind of chronic inflammatory if you're being exposed to you know different chemicals through your work environment that may be ticking off the immune system at a low level for a long time, um, you're kind of gonna force them to hold this, uh, this pattern for too long and that causes a, a lot of the other issues. Uh, as far as helping combat that, I'd say improving diet is probably the biggest thing. Um, and we, we spend a lot of time in our lab looking into different diets. Uh, my advisor is actually the editor in chief of Journal of Medicinal Foods. Hmm. Um, and we have uh, one of our biggest projects that we have a lot of funding from the NIH from is a sesame oil project, um, looking at some of the anti inflammatory components of sesame oil, which has actually been really interesting. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways. Uh, and we, that's something that we actually do spend a long time and a lot of effort, you know, thinking about. Excellent. I uh, want to ask you real quick before we get off topic. Do you have any thoughts on the ketogenic diet? I myself have found incredible success and, and great results from that. I feel better mm -hmm. on it. I know not everyone responds well to that. Um, and is that that differential response perhaps an immune uh, like differences in immune regulation? Or I don't know if you've done a whole lot of research or reading into it. Uh, yeah, I actually have uh, a decent bit, you know, being in a, a lipid or, or a fat metabolism lab, uh, obviously that's going to come up at some point. Sure. Um, and I actually have some friends in the PhD program that have gone on to the keto diet. Um, one of my friends, I think her handles at keto and caffeine on Instagram. That's perfect. Uh, that's my diet. Yeah, <laughs> <exactly>. <laughs> <In a nutshell. laughs> 
uh, and she's a good friend of mine and, and she, you know, it really turned her life around for her. Um, it's definitely an extreme diet. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it can be difficult for people to keep. Um, but I think there's clear evidence that it works very well for certain conditions. You know, like it was, it was first founded to treat, um, I believe it was epilepsy, was it? Yep. Yeah. And so there's certain things that it works very well for. Um, and like I said, this is something that we think about a lot in our lab. And uh, I always ask, have people ask me about it, like, what's the perfect diet? What's the diet that humans should be eating? And it was always a frustrating question because if you go through the research, there's so much conflicting research saying that this is what we should be eating or this is what we should be eating. Mm -hmm. And after kind of driving myself crazy about this, I finally came to the realization that there just isn't a perfect diet for all people. Um, and I realized this a lot in lab because I study these pathways in immune cells um, and I have to use human immune cells for my research. <laughs> and so we'll get them from different donors. And it really blows my mind how differently these cells can react. They're the same exact cells that I'm isolating. Uh, for people who are kind of in the field, I work with monocytes and macrophages. And um, these immune cells will react very differently based on the donor that I get them from. Mm -hmm. And it can be very frustrating for me because I'm trying to get you know statistical significance. And if these values keep changing, I have to do, do a lot more work, uh, but it really opened up my eyes to, to how different these cells can be inside of people. And so for as far as the perfect diet goes, I think that's why people struggle with that question so much is because they're asking the wrong question. Uh, there isn't a perfect diet for everyone. Uh, what there is, is there's a best diet for each individual. Um, and that's kind of where I think the field is going right now is being able to get the diagnostics, you know, with these, uh, DNA analysis, epigenetic analysis, you know, looking at how you process uh, the different foods that you eat. And I think you're going to see a lot of companies spring up, you know, over the next decade that help people figure out what's their personal best diet. Are you somebody who's going to need to have a more plant based diet based on, you know, your genetics and how your body responds? For some people, the ketogenic diet, I think, will be the best diet. Um, but it's really difficult to make those blanket statements because uh, I've become a lot more aware in doing my research and, and working so intimately with so many different you know, cells from different people, how much people can actually differ to the same stimulus. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I think it's important that people are kind of mindful when they're trying out these new diets of, okay, it's possible that I do have adverse effects. <clears throat> and you know, the ketogenic diet is one of those weird ones uh, from my own personal experience in that there is this keto flu for two to three weeks when you're on it. And mm -hmm. um, it's hard to get through. But once you get through it, like the cloud lifts and everything's fine. But for some people, it, I, I imagine that could be a persistent flu kind of, of state. So I know it's not for everyone. Um, and that's just one example. But it is really it is really great to do this research. And um, I that statement you made about the differential response just in a culture uh, setting is really interesting to me. Do you have any thoughts on like why some people's monocytes or some people's macrophages, their immune cells are reacting differently, even in like a plastic uh, dish or where, however you're studying them? Um, is it maybe a condition of, you know, were they sick at the time of, of harvesting perhaps, or I don't know if you have any ideas there. Yeah. Um, so obviously that's something I think a lot, a lot about as well, because it, mm. it kind of drives me nuts sometimes. <laughs> I want everything to work the exact same each time so that I can, you know, of course. <laughs> pin down. Um, but, but it comes down to a lot of things. I mean, it, it really makes you appreciate the complexity. I'm just looking at one pathway in a lot of these experiments that I do. And just that one pathway differs between a lot of different people. Um, and there's thousands of these pathways of cells talking to each other and changing how they metabolize things and how they fight things. Um, and I think the differences one come down to your DNA, you know, people are going to, uh, come from different places all over the world where these isolated populations have, you know, evolved slightly differently. Um, and then on top of just DNA differences, there's also, uh, what we call the epigenetics, right? So the DNA is the hard code and the epigenetics is, um, what genes do you actually have access to? Right. And so if you think every cell in your body has the exact same DNA, but how is it that a skin cell behaves so differently from a cell in your stomach? Um, and so what the cells do is they actually coil up the pieces of DNA that sh they shouldn't be expressing and pack them into tight balls 
so that those genes aren't read. And in the genes that they need to be a skin cell, they open those up so they can be read. And in the stomach, the genes they need to be a stomach cell, they open that part of the DNA up. And so we call this the epigenetics, and they do it through a lot of different mechanisms, but it's basically how the cells are able to read that DNA. Um, and so lifestyle can play a big, uh, a big impact on a cell's epigenetics. So we usually get anonymous donors. Uh, we go through some of our friends at One Blood, and then they'll send me some blood. I'm able to isolate the immune cells, and I can work with those. Um, and with anonymous donors, you know, I, I, you don't know the background. So you can have people who are eating healthy and exercising, and over time, you'll actually with that lifestyle change your epigenetics a bit so the cells as they're responding to this new environment if you're holding that environment long enough they'll be like okay we need these genes to respond to this environment and so they'll start remodeling the dna a little bit and so some genes may be more susceptible to being expressed so if i'm looking at the prolactin gene um, and one of the things i'm looking at right now is i can actually use adrenaline and noradrenaline to trigger them to produce this prolactin which is uh, an interesting thing. And so if somebody's epigenetics or lifestyle allowed their cells to open that prolactin gene to being read a little bit more, then it's going to respond more intensely to that stimulus. Whereas somebody who's living a different lifestyle, um, then that gene may be closed off a little bit more and they may not have as much access to it um, from the same stimulus. And so what things actually cause that is is one of the things that we're studying right now to try to figure out you know, what lifestyle changes can open these genes up more and, and make them more likely to be expressed. Um, but, you know, it's still a little early in the project for us to, to make any claims there yet. Yeah, of course. That, that's, that's super cool. Uh, I didn't realize that prolactin could be released by noradrenaline or adrenaline. Is that, That's a physiological response as well. So say someone's like an adrenaline junkie, are they going to have maybe different uh, tolerance to, to that and then induce prolactin in a little different way? This is pure speculation. I don't expect it. Yeah. Um, so prolactin is, is a tricky one because it's, it's probably one of the, it has more functions than almost any hormone in the body. So it's mm -hmm. well known for inducing lactation in women, but there's also over 300 defined functions. So that also wow gives me a, a little bit of a headache yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> when you're trying to pin down one specific thing. Um, but the context that we're looking at is, you know, people think of adrenaline as, uh, you know, with the fight or flight response. That's mm -hmm. obviously where it's most well known. Uh, but it's actually used every day in your body. So you have these fat stores and the way, one of the main ways that your body actually accesses the energy from fat is through your sympathetic nervous system. So those nerves that innervate the fat. Um, they'll actually just squirt out a little bit of um, adrenaline into the fat cells, and that is a very potent signal to release that fat. They cleave it out of the fat cells, and it goes into the bloodstream to be used. Now, obviously, in a fight-or-flight response, that's the extreme version. You dump a ton of adrenaline throughout the entire body, and that mobilizes a bunch of um, energy into the bloodstream to be used for the muscles so they can you know, fight or flight. <laughs> Uh, but it also does it on just a regular everyday level. If you haven't eaten in eight hours and you need to access those fat stores, your body's just going to squirt a little bit of adrenaline mm -hmm. into those fat stores to free that fat up. Um, and so if these immune cells are responding to uh, that adrenaline with these different hormones that regulate fat metabolism, then you've all of a sudden kind of thrown another piece into that. It should be adrenaline squirts into fat, fat's released to the bloodstream. But if these immune cells are interfering in any way, you can see how that would affect metabolism. Um, and there's a few ways they can do it. I'm studying the hormones that they release in response to that signal, like prolactin, mm -hmm. which could perhaps drive the fat cells to be in a more fat accumulating state and not listen to that adrenaline as much. Um, and other papers that have come out this year that have been pretty big, uh, I believe there there's one in Nature, a couple of them, uh, show that those macrophages are actually able to sit around those neurons and break down the adrenaline before it gets to the fat. And so uh, both of those kind of come to the same physiological end, which is the fat cells aren't responding to the stimulus correctly, um, and more of these nutrients stay in your bloodstream for kind of a longer period of time or you're not able to access those fat stores in a way that you should be able to access them. And so that kind of leads to a lot of the metabolic issues that people can have. Hmm. Very cool. Do you think, um, 
kind of related to your earlier statements, intermittent fasting could be beneficial for other people as well. Another thing <laughs> relates yeah. to my life that I do. Um, I, I kind of cycle on and off. Sometimes I'll not, you know, uh, most days I'm skipping breakfast, but sometimes I won't eat lunch until like two or three. Um, and I do feel like I have like less systemic inflammation during that time, but that's purely anecdotal, of course. Um, do you know any of the effects of intermittent fasting on these immune cells and how they would respond to like noradrenaline release? Yeah. Um, I wish I knew a little bit more about it. I, I've kind of, you know, in, in researching the different diets and coming across ketogenic, the intermittent fasting is a big, uh, seems to be a big part of that as well. Mm. Um, and to helping people go ketogenic. Um, and so I guess what I would, what I've heard from it is that it, some people claim that it helps if you talk about those epigenetic changes, um, that shift that you're trying to make to fat metabolism as opposed to sugar metabolism when you're going ketogenic uh, can be kind of difficult because you need to do that epigenetic remodeling and make some of those fat metabolism genes uh, more open so that those cells can access them more easily. And so I've heard some claims that the intermittent fasting will actually help speed up that process. You know, mm -hmm. I imagine it, it's kind of miserable when you're doing it yeah. until until you hit your stride. Um, but some people claim that intermittent fasting or, or fasting workouts uh, can help push your body into that ketogenic uh, state faster because it's really the shift from the metabolism of everyday diet to ketogenic that seems to be the hardest thing for people, you know, getting your body to actually make that transition. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've heard that that helps uh, make that transition. As far as the immune cells, uh, I don't know specifically with them. Um so the one thing I can say uh, that might be the closest thing to providing, you know, some sort of information there is so when you gain fat, right, when people become obese, you actually get an influx of these immune cells. Hmm. And so in a normal lean individual, uh, you may have about 15 percent of the actual cells and fat tissue will be these macrophages, these types of immune cells. Quite a lot. Um, it, wow. It is, yeah, and it actually gets way higher if, in cases of obesity, uh, when somebody becomes very obese, uh, you actually get this huge influx and in up to fifty percent of the cells in the fat tissue. Uh, in some cases, they've measured up to sixty percent can actually be these immune cells. So you actually have more immune cells in the fat than you have fat cells. Um, now, overall volume, these fat cells are much bigger than you know mm -hmm. the immune cells. So the majority of that is fat. Uh, but as far as the number of cells go, um, a lot of it will end up being uh, the macrophages. And so you can imagine if if there's a macrophage for every adipocyte, they can have a huge effect on how these uh, – and, and I think I've been throwing the word adipocyte out a bit. <laughs> that just is uh, the technical term for fat cell. And so when we talk about them, we talk about adipocytes. Um, and so these fat cells you know, can really be influenced by, by these immune cells in that way. And then in the case of intermittent fasting – uh, if you can get those fats and access them and, and kind of get them out of that fat tissue, you'll have these macrophages kind of come back out and uh, return those populations to normal a little bit. I don't know if that's specific to intermittent fasting. I think really any weight loss would probably have the same effect, uh, but that's kind of the closest information I think I could provide in that area. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. I don't <laughs> can't be an expert on everything. Um, what, <laughs> yeah, I noticed yeah. on like Reddit, people are asking us questions. It's like, I, I'm sorry, I don't study that. I can't really <laughs> tell you in, in an informed way. I just got to speculate. Um, so I, I guess I'm hearing you clear and, and correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, when someone gets obese or they're getting all this fat accumulation, then the macrophages actually move into the fat. It's not like there are more macrophages being produced by the body. So they're getting trapped there and they maybe don't have proper immune function elsewhere or is it just there's more macrophages and a lot of them go into the fat yeah so the way that they actually get into the fat tissue um and it kind of comes down to how we gain weight is is one of the big factors and so there's two ways that people can gain weight and one's called hypertrophy right and that's the actual increase in size of the fat cells right and so um, that's actually the most common way we do it. The other one is hyperplasia, which is an increase in number of fat cells. Um, for the most part, humans, when we gain a lot of weight, especially with the Western diet, it's almost entirely through hypertrophy, mm. right? So just the increase in size of the fat cells. So you keep the same number of fat cells in each fat deposit in your body, but they have to swell massively in order to take this fat in. 
Um, and that tends to cause a lot of stress on these cells. They have to produce a lot more cell membrane. They're really stretching it out. Um, and they're not able to activate, especially if there's some inflammation uh, involved is with, you know, eating a lot of fried foods or, or really refined sugars that enter the bloodstream really quickly. Um, as I mentioned before, that causes some inflammation and that'll also make it more difficult for them to kind of access what we call the pre adipocytes, which is this reserve of fat cells that haven't differentiated yet. You can almost think of them as a, a late stage stem cell. Um, and so that puts even more burden on the fat cells that you already have to take up more fat because they can't really call in you know, any extra cells to help them. And so, like I said, this really stresses out the fat depots. Uh, they have trouble storing the fat. You actually get some fat leakage into the extracellular space around them. Uh, and, uh, these macrophages kind of come in, I think, to try to help save the tissue and, and help these cells. They'll actually send out, the fat cells will send out immune signals as well. <laughs> you know, they can talk to the immune cells and they'll send out these, uh, different cytokines like IL-6, you know, any immunologists are listening and TNF alpha, uh, that are kind of help me signals. And so those macrophages will rush in and the macrophages actually take up some of the kind of spilt out lipids and stuff. They try to clean up as much as they can. Um, and you get the development of foam cells, which is actually something that you see in atherosclerotic plaque. You get these macrophages that have uh, taken up these all these fats, and they actually get these little droplets. It almost looks like a bunch of grapes inside of them, because uh, they're trying to take up you know this extra fat that's filling yes. out. And, it, and it, it does. You can imagine that this is just causing kind of a mess because these cells are trying to deal with all this at once. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how it can kind of create almost like a positive feedback loop for this inflammation as well. Right. So I know uh, people who are obese have a higher risk of uh, just in general getting sick or they don't tolerate infections as well <clears> generally. <throat> Maybe it's just because the their immune cells are so busy dealing with all this extra fat leakage perhaps. Yeah, there's actually um, something that happens with the immune system called uh, immune tolerance. And so I think that could be part, part of what's happening here is that even though the immune system is ramped up, you'd think it, that maybe it would be more effective at, at fighting off infections. But what actually happens a lot with the immune system is it has these built-in checkpoints, right? So autoimmune diseases have always kind of plagued humanity, but to deal with that, what the immune system does is naturally shut itself back down or try to shut itself back down after you know a few weeks of fighting an infection. And what that is, is kind of a built-in fail-safe to protect itself from autoimmune diseases. You know, if you, if you keep the immune system ramped up for too long, you're increasing the likelihood that eventually it's going to start reacting to cells that it shouldn't react to. Um, and so in that process, if you're constantly having this kind of low-grade inflammation, and then that scenario I just explained in the fat tissue can kind of cause a positive feedback loop to even, you know, build it up even more, um, even though your immune system's activated, uh, because it's activated for so long, you can actually make it less effective at fighting off different infections and it can kind of wear the immune system out. So yeah, I think that would be something that, that happens in, in this case. Very cool. Very cool stuff. This is, uh, this is so interesting to me because I <laughs> haven't had a whole lot of uh, background in immunology other than my undergrad. Um, and then we were going into like the really nitty gritty and we didn't really talk about kind of the practical effects and what's going to happen in a human or a patient or anything like that. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, you know, through most of my schooling, I, I'd go through an immunology course and a metabolism course, and I promised myself I would never get involved with the alphabet soup of immunology. Oh, you know, there's like <laughs> over a hundred interleukins and all these different signals, and mm. you know, dozens of different types of cells. And then metabolism, you know, from my biochemistry background, that was just a mess as well. All these different pathways you had to memorize, and I'm like, I will never touch this stuff. And now. <laughs> Lo and behold, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the things that you try to avoid sometimes that end up having the biggest uh, impact on you. So, how how did you get into your current research lab, and uh, like, what was your path out of undergrad? What was that switch, uh, that flip, that said, oh, maybe I do actually like this stuff? Yeah, it. Um, so I always liked science in general. Uh, I, I didn't. I actually started as a marine biologist. Um, so I went to Florida Atlantic University in South Florida, and my first research project I ever got on was actually studying sea turtles. Nice. <laughs> and so, yeah, and so I, I enjoyed the work. I was actually a research diver for FAU. So I was a certified commercial diver for research, scuba diving. That's super cool. Um, yeah, and so the next project I worked on was actually my introduction to a more medicinal type or biomedical type applications. And that was during my master's. I was working on a project 
And basically the flow of the project is there were two labs. One was an organic chemistry lab and we'd go out and as a research diver, I would collect coral, sponges, algae. Um, and that was actually really nice. You know, you get these paid trips down to the, the keys <laughs> by the school. Uh, and so can't complain too much about that. Yeah. Uh, and we'd bring all these different species back to the lab. We would extract uh, the different compounds that they make, you know, with all these different chemical extractions. And then we'd make all these different uh, preparations of those different chemicals they make. I would then take that to a neuroscience lab. That was actually my original focus, uh, more neuroscience based. And then we would test these on uh, Drosophila, fruit flies. Mm. And what we were looking at is to see if any of these compounds had neuroprotective uh, properties. So, you know, during high heat or low oxygen environments, these neurons tend to become damaged. Um, and this is similar to something that would happen during heat stroke or regular stroke. Uh, and there's nothing right now that can actually treat that. Uh, you just have to try to return blood flow to that area or cool it down. But there's this damage that happens to the neurons that's kind of almost irreparable in some mm -hmm. cases. So we were looking for compounds that could maybe protect the neurons until you could get blood flow back or, or something along those lines. Um, and, you know, it was a really fun project. But I was kind of bummed uh, because halfway through it, there was these huge budget cuts to the state of Florida. And the neuroscience lab had to react by moving to a different campus. And so it kind of ended the collaboration. Oh, no. And yeah, and that's kind of the moment I became acutely aware that, wow, like you have to kind of fight for your funding and it's not guaranteed. You know, as a, an undergrad or somebody volunteering in a lab, you don't think about those things as often because, you know, if you have a good PI, they're taking care of everything behind the scenes. Um, and so I became much more aware of that aspect of research, you know, that that your funding is not guaranteed. And so I ended up having UCF reach out to me. Uh, they were going through, and they're still going through this process of, of really building the recruitment for their PhD program. Uh, and it's a really neat program. We actually are building, or there's a whole site being built in the south southern part of Orlando, Lake Nona area, called Medical City. Um, and so UCF has brought their medical school down there. One of our research schools, uh, University of Florida has a pharmacology school. Sanford Burnham has a research institute, the VA hospital, Nemours Children's Hospital. So there's this huge area where there, all these medical facilities are being brought together and it's still growing. Um, and so that, they did a pretty good job selling me on that. And uh, they pretty much offered me you know, some guaranteed funding for the first year as far as a stipend while I do my rotations. Um, and after kind of going through that that hit of losing a project I really love because of funding, um, having something where it seemed a little bit more stable uh, was something that was attractive to me. And that's the thing with medical research, too, is it applies to the people that are paying for it. You know, sometimes it can be a little more difficult to convince people to fork over money for sea turtle research. Right. Uh, whereas, you know, this kind of research is something that really, you know, hits home for a lot of people. And so. People are more excited about it sometimes, and uh, there's more funding for it. And so, like I said, I, I loved science, um, and pretty much any science topic you put in front of me, once I get going, uh, I, I really enjoy it. And so uh, I've really liked this project as I've come in and uh, learned a lot more about it. Yeah, it's really a good point you make about funding, and it is really sad that we're kind of forced into, I mean, it's understandable, right? Like. People want to pay for things that will help them in the future. It's an investment on their part. The taxpayers are basically investing in research and the government allocates the money for that. If there was unlimited funding, would you be still looking at sea turtles um, and scuba diving off the Florida coast? <laughs> I'd imagine I would. Uh, but now looking back is difficult because I really enjoy this research so much. Mm -hmm. um, and I tend to be more of a people person. And so doing research that is important to people uh, I take a lot of pride in that. You know, my dad has type one diabetes actually. Um, and so to be able to really talk in depth with him about his disease, uh, he really enjoys it that I can do that. Um, a lot of my friends, you know, these are relevant questions to them. You know, I could talk to, I could talk about sea turtles or, <laughs> you know, chemicals from the ocean for, you know, an hour max before I, I kind of lose them. But when people are talking about their diet, why they feel certain ways, you know, how we digest things. These are things that mean a lot to people. And so seeing people react um, to the research and, and to this knowledge is, is really kind of the most exciting part of my job. And I like to go out and give talks to the general public. It's, I think, one of the most fun things you can do. Very cool. Yeah. And we're trying to develop a platform so that 
you know, you don't have to just be in Central Florida or local to you to hear about what you're doing. Um, I'm glad you, you came on. We can let people know what it's all about. Um, has has your research like changed the way you look at everyday life or changed your diet, perhaps your activity? Um, ha- has that really changed the way you think about um, the stuff you're eating? Uh, <coughs> Yeah, it definitely has. I I wasn't necessarily a horribly unhealthy eater before, um, but it's hard to not be kind of swayed. You know, we get we also, like I said, we're an atherosclerosis lab. That's kind of the main part of what we do. Um, And these, like I said, the immune system plays a big role in that, and so that's why my specific focus in the lab is on the immune system. Uh, But but we get a lot of samples in of you know human aorta that are sent in from different hospitals for us to study. And when you look at these aortas that come right out of the heart and you see all this plaque built up mm-hmm. and uh, it's it's pretty intense to see. And so it makes you really think about what's going on inside your own body. You can't see it, obviously, but when you're holding somebody else's heart in your hand and, and you see the damage that's been done to it, um, it's definitely going to have a, a way of affecting you a bit. <laughs> and so and so uh, the, a lot of the diet stuff we talk about in the lab. Um, And we are doing some research. Uh, We have some Crohn's projects that we're working on and irritable bowel bowel syndrome, um, just because they tied in well with some of our inflammation things we're studying. Uh, But a lot of that research I did on my own. And so I guess you could say that's uh, how it's kind of changed me a bit is is being more aware of that. And also because that's the questions I get. You know, a lot of my friends aren't scientists. And so the part of my research that directly pertains to them is like, hey, what should I eat? <laughs> and and after after, you know, a long time of not being able to give them a good answer, I'm like, I got to sit down and figure this stuff out myself. Um, and so, yeah, I, I did a lot of reading into that. And uh, and that's when I realized that nobody really has the answer that, yep. you know, you need to, to kind of be aware of what your own body and how it's responding to different things. Um, and so I would say the biggest thing I've become aware of in the diet thing is probably fiber though. There's a lot of papers that have come out pretty recently looking at the immune system's response, uh, in relation to gut health. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, we always thought about fiber as just some inert thing that helped, you know, kind of push through the digestive tract to keep it healthy. Um, but one of the things you realize is that that's an extremely important nutrition source for the gut microbes. Um, and you know, if you are eating the refined sugars, you absorb those so fast that they usually don't make it to the end of your gut where those microbes live. Um, and what that does is causes microbes that can, you know, digest parts of, you know, your intestinal lining, they kind of outcompete because they're the only ones that can eat anything in that area. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it throws off the balance, um, and that your immune system responds very intensely to what's going on in the gut. Um, it's constantly sampling. There's a lot of very immune specific uh, patches along your intestines that are constantly sampling, uh, you know, the environment there. And but if you eat, you know, high fiber diet with, you know, natural fibers from plants and things, not just, you know, you don't go eat a sheet of paper thinking that it's gonna <laughs> um, that's something that you can't digest yourself. And so it actually makes it all the way through the digestive tract to the end where a lot of those microbes live. And because it does that, it provides a very important food source for them. And they'll actually break some of that fiber down into uh, molecules that you can digest and actually do become part of your metabolism. And it also provides fuel for the correct bacteria, the ones that are supposed to be living there and, and live more harmoniously with your gut, you could say. Um, and so there's been a lot of great research just this year in particular, as a lot of the technology to study those gut microbes has caught up. You see a lot of these papers coming out now that, uh, the technology is there to do it. And it's, it's kind of been a little bit overdue. Yeah, Um, definitely. I mean, it's probably the biggest buzzword in uh, science right now is like the microbiome. It's hard to avoid at this point, no no matter your area of study. Um, Exactly. It's great that you're considering all these things and all these factors. And that was going to be one of my questions when you're looking at all these patient samples and you're wondering why are they different? Um, you don't you don't get like microbiome samples from them at the moment, do you? No, we don't. Um, most of the microbiome projects, uh, as far as I can tell, what really set off the whole uh, gut microbe and microbiome research is the uh, shotgun genomics. Right. And so the difficulty before was actually sampling the microbes. You know, all you can look at is fecal matter that comes out 
And, you know, the old way we looked at microbes is we plated them and let them grow. Right. Um, most of those bacteria won't grow on a regular plate. They're so specific to the gut that – so you would never know that they were there. Wow. Um, okay. And, at, yeah, in fact, the vast, vast majority of bacteria in the environment won't grow on a simple, you know, agar plate like we – like we have. Um, most of them are very specific to the environment. And if you change anything like temperature, fuel source, anything like that, they'll, they just won't grow. And so you won't be made aware of them. Um, and you know, there's a lot of other issues too, when you're trying to figure out the, uh, you know, balance of the populations, like is this population 60% and this one 40%, you know, if you're using those older methods, you wouldn't know because maybe one just grows faster mm -hmm. and, you know, those culture conditions, and that would give you the false assumption that there was more of them to begin with. And so the shotgun genomics approach allows people to take that fecal matter or, you know, any place on the body. And what they can look at is the actual how much uh, DNA that's specific for this species is present. And that's a pretty good proxy for how much of that specific um, population of bacteria is there. And so the development of that technology is what, uh, as far as I can tell, kind of set off this boom. You know, a lot of those big papers uh, came about because of uh, the labs had access to that technology. And so we don't do that technique. Uh, we could certainly collaborate with a lab that does. Um, and there's other ways to study the microbiome. But as far as I know, it seems like that technique in particular was one of the biggest uh, catalysts to, to that whole field. And some of the top labs you know, are very good at it. And that's what it takes. Very cool. So if you were to like give advice to the field as a whole, I don't know if you have any ideas for improvements, maybe microbiome would be one of them. Are there any others, um, things that you would like to incorporate in your studies? If you had, again, this is a fanciful, uh, fantastical scenario, but if you had like unlimited funding and you had unlimited resources, how would you go about studying maybe a little better? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest advances that's going to come is probably going to be uh, the artificial intelligence. And uh, just because there's so much data out there, there's massive and massive amounts of data. And as I mentioned, um, we've kind of seemed to have picked a lot of the low lying fruit. And now we're getting into more of these very personal differences. And that's something, especially in metabolism, like I mentioned, that each person's different. And so we found a lot of the things that are already the same amongst big populations. And now it's time to start narrowing it down and, you know, really understanding the differences between smaller populations or individuals. Um, and in order to do that, it's going to take massive amounts of data. You know, somebody needs to go in and, and be diagnosed for certain things. It's really going to help uh, a doctor or researcher if they know their DNA, if they know how the DNA is ordered or structured. And that's a massive you know, even if you get the diagnostics, it's a huge amount of data coming in. Um, and to, to just process all of that by hand and analyze it would just pretty much be impractical, yeah. I think. Yeah, um, that. <laughs> exactly. And so I think soon you're going to start seeing artificial intelligence worked into these processes a lot more. Um, if for anything, just to bring relevant information to a researcher or doctor's attention. Um, there's so much data out there that it really is difficult to find things that are relevant to what you're studying. And it can be really difficult to find things that may be relevant to a diagnosis as well for, for a doctor. Um, and so having that uh, ability of artificial intelligence to try to go through and maybe at least bring things to your attention, it it'll, might be a while before it can actually make decisions on its own, but just bringing things to your attention will be a huge help, um, I think, in all of these fields. And so I see that as one of the biggest uh, next advances that we're going to make for one precision medicine, which is kind of the buzzword for, mm -hmm. you know, treating each patient individually and not just as, you know, a statistic from a clinical trial and also in, uh, in the research that we're doing. So very cool. Yeah. It, I mean, in any course of study, we want to be able to know about those extra variables that are possibly the reason why things are <clears throat> not acting as a, a law of averages. <laughs> It's always yeah. really interesting, but it's hard to figure out exactly what it was that, that skewed your data. So, Exactly. And so I, I wish I, I had a more concrete idea of uh, how exactly that, you know, these big data processes are going to fit into our research. If I did, I'd probably buy some stock in those companies. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, you know, it's kind of being worked out still. But I think you'll see a, a big leap forward um, as, as it happens. Super cool. So it sounds like you've done a ton of work. Uh, very busy, probably. Do you have time to get outside of the lab? And if so, what do you do when, when you're relaxing? Yeah, uh, I 
my time outside of the lab is very important to me. <laughs> and so um, I, I try to stay pretty busy. You know, I, I was a big, I'm a big ocean guy, as you probably noticed from the, the scuba diving. Right. Uh, so I surf a lot. I actually sailed for FAU for three years on the collegiate sailing team. Um, and so love being around the water. And more recently, you know, probably in the past six or seven years, um, I've started climbing a lot, actually, which is a weird sport for a Floridian. <laughs> but <laughs> Where do you do but, that? <laughs> yeah. So um, I started in just climbing gyms around here uh, and on campuses and stuff. UCF actually, strangely enough, has one of the nicest collegiate climbing walls in the country. Uh, and you know, got hooked on it. And I realized some of my old friends, you know, from childhood had actually moved to, you know, different places in the United States and become big climbers. And so I started going out there, actually got into ice climbing, weird enough. I think I'm the oh. only, <laughs> the only Floridian around here that, that has crampons sitting in my closet. Um, and now we're getting into uh, mountaineering. So we, we climbed Mount St. Helens last year and, and skied back down at uh, Mount Stewart, you know, in the summer, which is a mountain up near Canada and Washington. And, uh, you know, these big things are, are nice to get out there and you're scared to death the entire time. So you're not thinking about research or <laughs> right. anything else, really. Get a little yeah. adrenaline and noradrenaline release. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you get plenty of that. Um, and it's nice because it's just so different from the lab that it, it really helps me reset my mind and refresh. And, and I actually, by the end of those trips, I really miss my research. So it helps me come back and, and kind of with a, you know, greater speed. Mm -hmm. So um, scuba diving to ice climbing, you can do it all. Damn. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's mostly because I have good friends, you know, they're already mm -hmm. out there doing that. And so I can hop out of the lab and go hop onto their expeditions with them. And so that helps me a lot. <laughs> Very cool. Um, thank you so much for coming on, Ricky. Uh, if people want to reach you, you're pretty active on Reddit and Instagram, right? Yeah, both of those. I more recent on Reddit. I've kind of just joined it and really had a blast on there, mm -hmm. you know, talking to you yeah it's, it's yeah cool. exactly you're definitely helping people you're answering a lot of questions on there if, i'm sure if people um have questions that's probably a great portal right yeah i'd love to talk with people uh, on there and i try to go on there and, and answer some questions if if they're questions that you know i have any expertise in um and then instagram you know i use it pretty similar to everyone else but i i post stories you know every other day of us in lab and so if you kind of want to check out you know what's going on and what it's like you know, messing around in the lab and everyone hanging out, uh, you're more than welcome to follow me or, or ask me questions on there as well. Um, but both of those are, are Rick Bar 21. So R I C K B A R R 21. So if anybody wants to reach out with me, they're more than welcome to. I'd love to talk. Perfect. Um, yeah. And we'll toss that in the show notes for anyone interested, just so they can have the direct link. Um, do you have like one last minute question? Do you have any advice for students um, who are perhaps like an undergrad or maybe even high school or younger looking to get into your field specifically or just science in general? Um, anything that helps you along the way, resources and ideas, trains of mind? Yeah, I would. Um, if you really want to get into research in particular, I would get into a lab um, as soon as you can, because you're going to learn a lot from being in that environment um, and also find out if it's really what you want to do. You know, it's not it's not always the same thing that people picture before they get there. And so find out what it actually is like going into a lab every day and, uh, you know, making exciting discoveries, but also being extremely frustrated that your experiments aren't working for, you know, That's weeks right. on end. Um, you got to be able to take the good with the bad. And so I'd recommend that as well. And also there's a lot of different jobs you can do in science. Um, like I said, I like science in general. Um, and so I, I ended up in research, but if you like science, it's not just research. I would, you know, people spend a lot of time studying specifically for their classes and spend very little time actually studying job markets and what jobs are available and what those jobs are like. And that's the end goal that you're trying to do is get a job that you like. So, you know, spend, as, you know, even half as much time researching what the jobs are like and what the lifestyles are like for the people who work those different jobs and careers um, spend at least half as much time doing that as you do studying for your actual tests. Um, and it'll, it'll really give you a lot of, uh, good feedback and you'll be a lot more confident going forward if, if you already know where you're going. Yeah, that's great advice. You got to pick your head up and get some perspective every now and then. Uh, long exactly. line, what's next for you? You got any big plans, uh, after graduating? How far are you from the, the PhD graduation? I know that's always a, a touchy subject, but 
Yeah, I, uh, so I'm in my fourth year here, and I'm hoping to finish up by the end of uh, this calendar year, so December. Um, and in our program, we have a, a prerequisite to graduate, which is we need two first author papers. So I just got the first one out, and so I just need to finish the other one uh, this year. So hopefully we're on, we're on schedule. <laughs> you know, it always comes down to the experiments. Um, and for me, I actually am looking to go a somewhat non-traditional path. I want to go into either biotech or pharmaceutical type research in a, in a management or, or director position. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the research. I love being in lab and, and being in the nitty gritty of it. Um, but one thing I've noticed from being in a wet lab is I miss uh, having a lot more people interactions. You know, most of the people that I interact with are already cut up and delivered to us in test tubes. <laughs> so it doesn't have a, it doesn't have the same you know, stimulus is interacting, you know, with, with everyday people. And so, uh, going to those environments where I still am around the science, I'm still being challenged by the science. Um, I need that, but, uh, they also, you know, tend to push you out there more interacting with a lot of different people and, and wearing a lot of hats and, and doing a lot of different types of work. And so for me, that's kind of what I'm focusing on now is looking at some of those, those biotechs and, and company based science. So, Nice. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that's uh, non-traditional anymore. I think more and more people are yeah. going towards industry, <laughs> consulting, even government policy and stuff like that. Academia is probably one of the smaller. We had a presentation on it recently, actually. I think it's only like one fifth of I'm at UNC. UNC graduates for, uh, with their PhD went on to academia. So it's it's less and less common, actually, especially now that we have biotech blowing up um, like crazy. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's funny because it, just out of habit, we always refer to that anything that's not academia as a non-traditional path. But yeah, sure. just like you mentioned, nowadays, um, you know, the academic funding hasn't grown at nearly the pace that the scientific training has, and so you're getting proportionally way more researchers being created than the funding's increasing. And so, um, you know, a lot more people are choosing those non-traditional paths. And for me, that's kind of always where I wanted to go. And so I'm glad that there's that many opportunities. Hopefully I can uh, find a good one as I finish up here. <laughs> Absolutely. I wish you luck and uh, keep us updated on your next paper. If you want to send me the link to your first one, I don't know if it's in review or published, but we could toss that in the show notes and people can take a look at uh, like really what you do, science, uh, science, really science intense, I guess I would say. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to. It's a pretty, it's a pretty short paper. Uh, just to start off the project, we wanted to stake our claim with some of the, you know, beginning genetic work, sure. uh, but it was published in scientific reports last month. So I'll send the link over if anybody wants to take a look at it. Very nice. It's good general. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Ricky. Uh, anything else you want to say to the audience? Um, ideas you want to put in their brains? I think that's pretty much it for now. You know, if anybody has any questions or anything, like I said, feel free to reach out to me. Um, it's pretty stoked you reached out, reached out to me to be on this podcast. It's been it's been pretty exciting getting to actually share this with everyone across the country without even having to leave my room. <laughs> That's what we're about. Yeah, these Skype interviews are sure are convenient. So, hey, maybe yeah. if I take a trip down uh, Central Florida at some point, we could do a local one and be even better audio quality for the audience. And- yeah, I'll be happy to show you around the lab and and uh, and do all of that. So definitely hit me up. Yeah, we'll be in touch. Thanks again, Ricky. This has been great. Yeah, no worries. Thanks to you too. See ya. Thanks for listening.